Hey everybody, uh, sorry this got a late start. I was going to start at about 3.30 and it's about 3.45, but I was running a little bit behind thanks to traffic. There was four accidents on the freeway that involved like the police holding traffic up, not blaming anybody, but that did take you a while to get home. So I'm just getting started now. Um, that said, because I have to pick up my son and other son and Tyler in an hour, um, instead of doing the live read of myself and five or six authors, I'm going to do myself and three to four. Uh, for sure, well, four to five. For sure, it's going to be me, and then, you know, uh, C.D. Gorey, uh, C.D. Gorey, uh, Amanda Kimberly, uh, Marie Andreas, and Patricia Nett, and then maybe if I have time, Jay Dan Dotson, because I read from her all the time, and she's one of my favorites. Uh, but I'm going to start right now with my book, uh, A Shattered Truce, which, uh, real quick, it is loosely inspired by the game Strange Odyssey, which was a text adventure by Scott Adams, who wrote all the first text adventure video games, well, text adventure games, no videos. Um, hey, Mama Fang. Hey, Joe. And um, I wrote it as a book that's called Flight of the Cyrano. And uh, a while ago, um, I decided to rewrite it as a novella. It was a novella already, but I decided to rewrite it and make it just increase the improve the writing a little bit because I was still very new to this whole thing um, a long time ago. And um, I've redrawn the cover almost entirely. I haven't really shown anybody the new cover yet. Um, I'm still working on it. But I'm looking to re-release it soon, either through a publisher if I can find one, or self-publishing it again. We'll see. Um, one thing I actually... Hey, Pat, my, my, my BFFF <clears throat> and co-author of Domino Effect, which is coming out eventually soon. But anyways, um, I wrote a prologue that takes place 15 years before the story starts. This is still kind of rough, so I'm going to read from a couple of pages of this and then move on to the next one. Um, so... Real quick, here's a fighter jet I drew. It's a space jet I drew. Hopefully, uh, I actually hand drew this with a mouse. Uh, it took me like four hours to draw it, so I think it looks almost photorealistic. I just want to see you guys to see it. Anyways, that's that is one of the fighter jets that's in the in the book. Um, it's just in this case, it's just part of the cover uh, that'll be there as well as some chapter art. But I hope you guys like it. And, okay, so here we go with the prologue, and I'm just going to read a, a little bit of it. Okay, again, this is going to be kind of campy, because I, this is just first draft of the rewrite. Ice coffee, in case anyone's wondering. Prologue, 2256, which is the year. Goal leader to Titan, we are feet cold. Roger, goal leader, good hunting. That's a Raj. I make, I make approximately 20 bogeys. I confirm, Volmerian spacecraft. It looks like a handful of weasels intercept, weasel interceptors. Well, there's a typo right there. One second. Weasel interceptors and perhaps six Marta torpedo bombers en route. Major Brandon Free, which is his call sign, Fall. Brandon Fall is his name, in case you, know, you can't read it. Uh, but Free would be his call sign. Cut the signal and clicked over to his squadron. Ghouls, we have to take out the martyrs before they begin their countdown. Raid squadron will engage the weasels. Acknowledge. He heard a number of mic clicks, which indicated they heard and understood. By the way, this is a space opera kind of thing, in case you're wondering. As a leading fighter and wing commander, um, he oriented his nose directly at the lead VF-21 martyr torpedo bomber and armed his heat heart seeker, identify friend or foe, IFF, um, missiles. He was out of range still, but his computer began warbling as a subtle lock-on. The martyrs had super superb sensors, a requirement for their task of killing capital ships, and there was little doubt the pilot was already where he was being painted. This was standard, ta this was standard tactic employed by the Terran Federation Space Forces. forces sorry. <laughs> the martyrs' sole attack was to line up on their target and then engage their afterburners along with a one-off burst thruster that propelled it forward at five times the speed of any other craft. It would then launch its 10-meter-long bullseye torpedo at nearly point-blank... <laughs> wow, it's hard to do this without glasses. Point-blank blank range. The tactic Brandon was employing was essentially uh, warning the enemy pilot that he was targeted. Basically, a heads-up that his or her attack would be futile and fatal, hopefully convincing the pilot to turn away or abort. Brandon had seen it work one time. Uh, Linus, yes, Linus Martin. Uh-huh. He tensed, knowing that a missile lock was not a sure kill against these crafts, since he moved quick enough to dart past the missile. So real quick, the idea of this fighter jet, uh, called the Martyr, that the bad guys use, um, is that basically it locks on to a target, like a, like a capital ship, 
and it fires its afterburners at full speed, basically firing, uh, just basically an all-out attack. Kind of got the idea of Star Trek. There was that one ship that actually over, that made its generator over, overheat, whatever, by over overdoing itself so that it made it more powerful than it appeared, but in the process would destroy itself once it was done. Same kind of process here. It, it, fire, it does an all or nothing kind of shot straight at its target. Fires its, uh, you know, so it, super, let's say this is the carrier. Fires at super fast, super high speed and drops its launch torpedo like about this far away and then tries to turn away. Knowing that once it's done, it's probably going to die in the process. But, um, <laughs> typo. <laughs> but like I said, at the same time, these fighters are very unmaneuverable. And they're nicknamed martyrs because they basically are going to, basically like a suicide attack. They fire their uh, torpedo last minute, and then they usually get killed either on the way there, or after they launch a torpedo, they have no armament at all or defensive shields. So the, the enemy craft are able to, you know, the enemy fighters are able to blow it, up, blow it to pieces because A, it's very slow turning and unmaneuverable. If anyone ever knows anything about aircraft, the MiG-25 that the Russians use is the same thing. It fly, flies really fast, but it turns slowly like a station wagon. So it's an easy target if someone gets behind it. Hey, how's it going? So anyways, um, that's kind of the whole idea of the Martyrs. It is, you know, it's, a, it's a quick fighter, very fast, but it's really good for one thing. Killing, killing destroyers, sacrificing itself for a bigger ship. Not a bad idea, unless you're the pilot. Anyways, to bore you, that was the, that was the idea there. He tensed, knowing that a missile lock was not a sure kill against these crafts, and so he moved quick enough to dart past the missile. This is why the tactic, while clever, rarely dissuaded the martyr pilots. They already knew they were most likely doomed when they climbed into the cockpit. Scaring them into disobeying an attack order was unlikely to stop their attack launch. The VF-21 martyr carried with it an infamous history, and here's a little, the same explanation I just gave you guys. The fighter had an excellent record of killing capital ships. Their speed, courage of the pilots, and its one-hit kill capacity or capability made it a dreadful weapon of the enemy. However, they were also horribly clumsy, having a turn rate that was comparable to a turtle doing an about face. This meant that once it finished its torpedo run, it was an easy target for the Terran fighters, as it could as it could only slowly reorient itself, and its normal speed without its afterburners. I mean, no, sorry, its normal speed with its afterburners depleted was equally slow. Thus, only pilots who had fallen into disfavor accepted these missions as a way to regain their honor. Survivors being accepted back into the ranks of the upright pilots. Okay, the last two pages. Um, I'll read more of this maybe tomorrow. Um, Again, this is called uh, Flight of the Cyrano, but uh, that originally that was the title of the book, but now it's going to be called um, Flight of the Cyrano is going to be the series, and book one is probably going to be called A Shattered Truce, because that's what happens in the first book, is the truce is shattered. And this uh, prologue that I was written from is 15 years ago when the truce started. Okay, so now the next book I'm going to read is from my friend uh, C.D. Gorey, and let me show you the cover here. And this is uh, on pre-release. I think it's coming out February 7th. Um, Christine, if you have a chance to send the link, I don't have a way of pasting it into the video when I'm doing it. So if you want to paste it here below, uh, that'd be great. Look at that cover. That is so cool. This guy's badass, too. Look at it. He's ripped. I mean, he's not as good looking as me. We all know that. But he's ripped. Just kidding. He's much better looking than me. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and pull the book up. And it's called Vampire Lover. Let me just get this open here. And while I'm waiting for this PDF to open. Hey, Varden. Varden, I still need to read from your book sometime, man. Um, let's send me a message so we can read. Maybe I can read from yours tomorrow. I'm, I'd be happy to do it. Okay. So Vampire Lover by C.D. Gorey. Interior design by Amanda Kimber Kimberly, who I'm reading from next. Okay. So tagline, um, guys, hold on one second. I don't have my regular glasses, but I do need glasses to read this one. Um, I need like 10 seconds. Okay, I should be wearing my glasses. Anyways, this is my old pair, my last pair, my new pair I got two years ago and I got a new pair this year. So yeah, you get a free one every two years. Well, it's not really free. But anyways, um, here we go. Now, these glasses didn't really help me much, but I'll do the best I can. Terrence Davies never dreamed he'd be worthy of finding its, his true mate. Then Daisy moves in. Is the sexy normal ready for a vampire lover? 
<laughs> oh, wow. Well, I just got my glasses about 10 years ago, but these are my last pair. I got these in 2016. I got another pair in 2018. Now I got another pair this year. We'll see which way I go. I, these ones look okay, just not my style, I guess. Okay. So I'm going to go right to the prologue. There is a kind of an about the story thing here which looks really cool. Um, this is, you know, about, about, about Vampire Lover. But I want to get to the story. Um, so when I sh if you're cool with that, uh, Christine, I'll just go right to the uh, prologue. And um, for the record, my, my, my oldest is here. He's 14. Hey, Andrew. Uh, that said, if I muffle a word, it's because it's adult. So just be prepared. Uh, you'll, you'll, I, it's pretty obvious what I'm doing, so. Well, thanks, Christine. What the? Do you mean you're out of wild ver venison blood? Terrence growled into his brand new cell phone as he hustled through the streets of Manhattan towards his apartment building. It was his third phone this month, and from the crunching sound it just made as he squeezed the piece of junk, it would not be his last. Probably a flip phone. Oops. <laughs> Damn things are pretty flimsy when pitted against the strength of a hung hungry vampire. Chupacabra's... Butcher had his supplier for decades, but now the man was retiring to South America and his idiot son-in-law was in charge. The younger male simply did not understand good service. Pietro, I have an outstanding order for the past 57 years. Why the f*** would you cancel without checking with me? He closed his eyes and counted to ten. Patience, Terrence. You can't kill a man through a cell phone. Yet. Just, just, say, just throwing that out there. Pietro, just send the goddamn cow blood via special courier tonight. No, it has to be tonight. I have work tomorrow, and if it can't fulfill my future orders, I will have to go through Charlie. You have one more chance, but that's it. Fine. Bye. He ended the call and ground his teeth together. The cracked screen blinked at him as he hit the little end call button. Piece of shit. Another thousand dollar piece of tech down the drain. The emptiness... Why, didn't you go through, like, T-Mobile and get the deal where you get it, like, half off? Well, maybe you went through Verizon where they rip you off. Okay, back to that. The emptiness in his stomach clawed at him as he hustled to his home. Fuck. He'd gone too long without feeding. Being a vampire in the 21st century wasn't exactly easy. First off, there were all those pesky wannabes. There was something about sparkly, glittering vampires that made his nose twitch. Uh, oops, scroll down too far. Second, everyone from the government to the nosy neighborhood cat lady tracked your online orders and any other suspicious activity like bloody hunting dogs. He couldn't feed from the local vampire coven's donors. Not since he left the ranks after that unpleasant business with his childhood friend. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, not to mention, even the warranties are like $150 of a down payment. But how was he supposed to eat, for fuck's sake? The world had gotten a lot smaller the more technologically advanced the normals became. Damn, he missed the good old days, when people were a lot fewer and farther between. Still, of all the places in the world, the crowded streets of New York City would always be his home. He turned his head as a supernatural hearing picked up the sounds of the passers-by. Everything was normal. Boring. Busy. But still normal. That was good, actually. Uh, he could go home and wait for his delivery in peace. Mull over his work day. Make plans for tomorrow. A perfect night. Terrence thought over the latest musical Pax had delivered to him and his business associate. Broadway hit producer Chance Maddock. The story was a cont continuation of the man's previous hit, The Beast of Brooklyn Heights. Fans and critics have both raved and slammed the writer. Whoops, I forgot this is in Kindle, so I gotta scroll down. For leaving the remade Beauty and the Beast fairy tale unfinished. Terrence had loved the way it was, but the sequel had, been ch had him chomping at the bit. Leandra, Chance's wife, would keep the female lead, of course. Both leads eagerly signed on, of course. Terrence would direct them and most of the original cast in this continuation story. He couldn't wait. The score was original and the lyrics profound. A truly unique telling of things from the Beast's point of view. Where Beauty Lives would be the final act in the heart-wrenching love story. Oliver Pack still had not shown them the final score, preferring to keep the surprise to himself, but that did not matter to Terrence. Chance had bitched and moaned, even threatened to take away his backing, but Terrence knew him better than that. Chance couldn't walk away from this story any more than he could, any more than he could, sorry, it was just that good. When the last show ended, Beauty had left the Beast determined to live her life, through, live her life though she swears her undying love. Heartbroken, the Beast is careless and is taken captive by hunters and madmen rotting as scientists. 
That, of course, is the true fear of all supernaturals. Yeah, just if you've ever seen Splash, my favorite movie of all time, by the way, being cut up in a lab underground somewhere. No wonder they remained in hiding. Shifters, werewolves, vampires, witches, and the like. They'd all vowed to stay hidden from humanity for obvious reasons. Mainly the morons would freak out and want to put every single species under a microscope. It was far better to stay in the dark. However, as a vampire who didn't believe in hunting the innocent for his required amount of blood, Terence had found that ordering specific animal blood from specialty butchers, supernatural ones at that, worked for him. Jorge, Jorge or George, I'm going to say Jorge for now, the elder chupacabra whose butcher shop was located on 182nd Street had always been reliable. His son-in-law, Pietro, was not. Sigh. It was his own fault for not keeping better track of his blood supply. His hunger gnawed at him, but he ignored it. A Dawson, not Dawson's. Well, I know it's J-O-R-G-E, but I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know if it's George or Jorge. I assume it's Jorge, but I'm not sure. I'm horrible today. His hunger gnawed at him, but he ignored it. Auditions went long today. Where Beauty Lives was bound to be another hit by Oliver Pax. There was another one in the, after that in the works as well. A retelling of Hansel and Gretel where the twins were actually a pair of bounty hunters looking for witches and supernatural creatures until Gretel falls in love with a werewolf. And the werewolf probably had candy. <laughs> uh, let's see. That would be a good show. Lots of fun and gore. Leander Maddock had the role of the witch and a younger unknown would play Gretel and the up-and-coming Michael McGregor would play Hansel. Chance had already signed on to produce the show, bringing him three hits in a row if the half-demon's golden touch stayed true. Not that Terrence really cared at this moment. At that moment, sorry. He was tired and hungry, tired, hungry, and out of sorts. Ooh, Dachshund's nice. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> a nice stick steak would serve him well, but he needed blood first. Oh, steak sounds good. Tonight. Now. If he couldn't have the venison he preferred, he'd have to wait for the cow blood Pietro had promised he would be delivered to his apartment within the hour. He only hoped the idiot remembered to sift it well. Nothing worse than bits of bone and fur in your blood. Ooh, Oh, that thought's not going to get out of my head for a little while. Ugh. <laughs> Black. <laughs> like he said. He entered the building and casually took the stairs two at a time. It was an older brick and mortar construct, but one of his favorites. <laughs> nice gift. Rent controlled, busy, but clean part of town. He bought it at the, end, at the turn of the last century because he'd liked the location. It suited him these days to play the landlord while he busied himself with directing. The excitement of Broadway still, Broadway still captivated him at every turn. Whenever he began a new project, he always felt the thrill of starting all over again. Terence was settled into his routine, in his routine. Not a lot could surprise the man with, with a few centuries under his belt, he supposed. Directing had come rather easily to him. He took it up after decades of people watching from his hiding place in the shadows. Because of their long lifespans, vampires were often thought to be immortal. Some were, or as close to it as possible, he figured. But he was only 327 years old, young for his kind. All sorts of lore about vampires existed in the world, each one telling their own version of what they believed vampires to be. Dark masters, the undead, cold and unfeeling, blood-sucking fiends, basically. The best description he'd ever heard... That was a sigh, by the way. It said sigh. <laughs> the best description he'd ever heard that... Con ever heard had come from his great-grandfather after young and thoughtful Terence had raised the question at the tender age of nine of whether or not he was human. We are not the undead, my boy, he said and squeezed Terence's tiny hand in his old withered, withered one. Vampirism is more a mutation than a disease. So yes, we are human, but we are also so much more. Our longevity gives us the, an ability to feel more compassion for the briefly alive humans than they could ever feel for themselves. And when you are older, my boy, should you find your mate amongst them, may you give the gift of life to your chosen so that you can enjoy the centuries together as I and your grandmother have these past 25 years. Oh, why did I say 25? These past 500 years. Sorry about that. Hey, Ron. Hey, Darlene. Hey, Sandra. But there would be no mate for him. He'd locked up his heart a long time ago. It was better that way. And that was the prologue. Hey, Marie. Um, so anyways, that was, um, again, let me show you the cover. Just give me a second. That was Vampire Level, per Purely Paranormal Pleasures by author C.D. Gorey. And this is my first, I think this is the first time I've ever read any of her books on my, on my show, and I'm sorry about that. I've got to do this more often. I don't know what, why I hadn't read from it before. Um, 
but you can count yourself to be among my regular ones because I really loved your writing. That was incredible. I loved that story. Okay, so Amanda Kimberly is next. So let's move on to her, and then Marie, I'll get you next after that. Um, so first, let me show you the cover. This is called Forget Me Not um, by Amanda Kimberly. And it looks like uh, the illustrator was uh, C.D. Gorey, so awesome there. Oh, I'd love to. Well, uh, he looks like, oh, God, what's the rock singer this guy looks like? I'm trying to think of who he, I can't picture the name. But really good cover. Nice moon. Okay. Uh, well, wait. Got to see his belly button. Look at this. Huh. Huh, you looked. I didn't. Anyways, um, let's see. So let me go ahead and open up the PDF from that one. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? And this is by Amanda Kimberly. And I've never read this before either, just to let you know. So I don't think I've ever read anything by Amanda Kimberly. Uh, but here we go. And, oh, thank you for sharing the link there, Mama Fang. Tagline for Forget Me Not is the heart never forgives. Oh, forgets. Sorry. Wearing glasses and I still couldn't read it. Chapter, oh, chapter art. Got to show it. You know me and chapter art. I always like to show it when there is. That's really cool. And I love drop caps. I use them too. Cool P. I mean, the letter P, not, you know. Hmm. Hey, Pamela, I thought I was the one you wanted. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. Okay. Poppy has no idea what excited her about Ridge's profile. Oh, I, think I, I read this the other day, so I'm going to read it again. Awesome. But so, so I have read this before. But something made her want to accept a friend request after he joined her Titanic 2 Facebook group. He was a complete stranger to her, but then again, so was 99.99% .99 of New York, too. The only people she met since she moved here six months ago, she paid rent to or worked for. She had no friends, and for the first few months, that didn't bother her since memories of her rotten divorce and buying, bearing both her parents still loomed over her. Having people in her life would have made things worse. They all felt sorry for her back home in Saudi Daisy. Well, maybe I didn't read this one. I can't remember, but it sounds familiar. Tennessee, but her bitch of an ex stole them from her, stole from them too. The guilt alone made her fall deeper into a depression she didn't feel she could bounce back from. Oh, thanks, Pamela. <laughs> she moved from her hometown of Saudi Daisy, Tennessee to escape her old life, and she figured New York City to be the best place to get lost in. <laughs> Tell me about it. The one time I went to Manhattan, I got lost, but I loved it. She, what she didn't bank on was that was the cold was that was the cold that had nothing to do with the weather. No one seemed friendly, and they all seemed to be, to sport constipated looks on their faces whenever she wanted to give them a warm hello. Which is probably just I do that look good, don't I? <laughs> she hadn't realized how lonely her life be, became until she saw dots of signified Ridge was replying to her PM. Her heart did a somersault once the short paragraph popped up on her screen. Don't get too excited, Poppy. He might turn out to be like the rest of the dark souls in the city. She started to read the kind text. It was probably, no, it most certainly had been the kindest gesture she had had from any native New Yorker since she got here. I like it. Hi, Poppy. It is really nice to meet you. I was so happy to have come across your Titanic 2 group. I've been toying with the idea of purchasing a ticket for the maiden voyage for quite some time. Just asking for trouble, dude. Don't go on any boat called the Titanic. I mean, come on, the first one sank. What do you think's gonna happen to the second one? Just kidding. Poppy smiled at the paragraph. It wasn't overly personal, but it did have exclamation points in it after her name and after the meet you. Th that proved to be the warmest greeting she had gotten since she moved here. Crap, what should I respond with? Poppy taps her index finger on her chin for a few seconds and starts typing. I'm glad you're enjoying the group so far. Let me know if you have any questions while you peruse. There, that's a good reply. Her smile broadens at her quickness, but only for a few moments because she sees the dots on the PM again. Actually, I do have a question. Will this group have meetups before the maiden voyage? I'm kind of curious. Poppy quirked an eyebrow to the question. It was a legitimate one to ask. Many of the Titanic group, two groups were do, doing meet and greets beforehand because that's what they did with the first Titanic, but she couldn't help but wonder if his question was, tad, was a tad loaded in a completely different direction. <laughs> Good point. I haven't really thought about it yet because the departure is so far out, 
and my group is new. Perhaps when I get more group members, I'll revisit this. He's typing again, and Poppy assumes it's to persuade her to start a meetup. Well, I'd really like to meet you regardless. Is that a possibility? Name the place. Poppy's eyes widened. There was now no denying that this question was, in fact, a loaded one. I'm sorry, but I don't meet up with people from the internet that I just said hi to 50 minutes ago. Instead of hitting the shift key like she wanted to, her pinky hit the return key. Jesus, now he's going to think I'm a psycho bitch. I need to fix this. I mean, I'm sure you're nice and all, but can we get to know each other a little more before we meet? Um, IRL? I'm not... I'm sure IRL is an acronym. I just don't... In real life. Oh, get it, get it, get it. Oh, thanks, Christine. She tried to type it fast, and considering she was a journalist for a living at one point in her sordid past, she touted, she, she touted in the fact that she was a pretty fast typist hovering around 100 words a minute, which I can do that too. I'm a very fast typist. Just saying. But she wasn't fast enough, and the words that flashed in the bubble right before her stung her heart. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to sound stalkerish. I can leave you alone. She waited a couple of seconds to see if dots would appear in response to her retort bubble, but when they didn't, she found her fingers typing back into the response. No, you aren't being stalkerish. It's just me being me. I'm new in town, and my Southern Belle attitude has not been scoring me friendships here in the Big Apple. Can we talk for a little? Then maybe after that we can go for coffee. That is, of course, if you can handle the warmth of my Southern charm. It was a feeble attempt on her part, but she still hoped he'd understand the subtle flirtation in her short paragraph. When she didn't see any more dots, she closed her laptop and headed to bed. Headed for bed. Way to go, Poppy. You fucked it up again. She let out a sigh and pulled the covers over her head. Sleep came within 20 minutes of hitting the pillow. Okay, that was chapter one. And I'll read more from this maybe tomorrow. Uh, again, that was um, Amanda Kimberly. And let me show you her book again. This is called Forget Me Not. Another purely paranormal pleasures book. Okay, and so next one um, is from one of my favorite authors, and one of my uh, one of my favorite people in the world is Marie Andreas, as authors go, especially. Um, and just to show you, I have several of her books right here, and this is not all the ones I own. This is just a couple of them. Um, first is the Diamond Sphinx. Sphinx. This is a six book series so far. Uh, I don't know if she's doing more of them. Hopefully, she is. And I own a couple of them. And this is um, number six, and it's. Um, Really good series. Um, number of, uh, I think, I don't know if it's a bestseller. If it's not, it should be. She's a great writer. Look at the cover. Um, and uh, the main character is Taryn is really, she's funny. Her fairies are funny. She has like these fairies that get drunk and are nuts. And it's a really good story. Um, the Glass Gargoyle I've read from, I've read from this. I've read from a little bit of all of her books. But um, <clears throat> then I have Warrior Wench. I have book one and book two of this series. It's the, it's the Sarlay War series. I have book one and two. Book three, which is called... I have this one. I have uh, Victorious Dead, which is book two. Defiant Ruin, which is book three. I do not own, but I will someday. Just, you know, I have, I have a budget. But this is a great series. I've been reading for this on Kindle as well. And then I'm excited about this one. This is her first steampunk novel, and this is called A Curious Invasion. It's The Adventures of Smith and Jones. And book two, I believe, is out now, or it's out for pre-release. I saw it on Amazon. Um, and so it's up for pre-order. I hope you guys will check it out. But as you can tell, I have several other of her books. Uh, the paperbacks are just in my closet and I didn't want to grab all of them out because it's kind of heavy and I'm a wimp. But let me show you her. It's cause this one is, um, is a short story and it's based on a one she wrote for an anthology. Nice. Well, the, mine make people drunk. I don't know what that meant, what I just said, so never mind. Anyways. Marie Andreas has the coolest book covers. I just got to show you this one, too. I'm going to do it anyways before I read it. Actually, real quick. So this, she wrote this for part of an anthology, and I guess she um, she decided to spread it, to broaden it out, make it a longer, you know, a full-length story. So I think it's like 95 pages. Um, this is just a look-inside thing. Um, but um, hopefully Marie will share a link to it. If not, I will when I get a chance. I'm opening up the cover right now. Um, while I'm doing this, waiting for this to open, just a reminder, um, if you are an author and want me to read from your book, just let me know. Um, this is kind of my tagline or whatever you want to say. I don't charge for this. I don't think I could if I, even if I wanted to, but I don't. I do this for the fun of it. 
So if you are an author of any kind of book and would like me to read from it, just send me a message on Facebook. I'll be glad to do it. Um, the only books I do not read really are BDSM or BSDM, whatever it's called. It's just a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm kind of a prude. There are a couple I have read, you know, that some of my friends have written, and that's fine. I just don't go for the hardcore stuff. It's just, you know, again, I'm kind of old-fashioned about that scent in that sense. I'm um, still waiting for uh, this the look inside thing to open, so bear with me. Come on. Come on, Amazon. While I'm waiting for it to open, let me just show you the cover. So you can at least check it out. So it's a Kindle right now. I don't know if it's coming out in paper book, but I hope so, because everything I've read by Maria is incredible. Hey, Christy. Let's see. Let's see if I can just refresh the screen to get it to load. Sorry guys, just bear with me for a second. Um, well, I was gonna read from the look inside thing, but it's just not loading. One second. Sorry guys. Hmm. Waiting for my Kindle to open as well so I can see if I can do it another way because I don't want to back out on this. Um, meanwhile, while we got here, um, if you have any questions for me about this or if any of you uh, that have read from or if, you know, if you're an author and want to mention one of your books to, to read from, um, feel free to put it in the comments. I'm just kind of waiting for this to, to open up. My computer is being a little slow right now. I think it's my computer that's the problem. Um, let me see. Let me see if I open up another thing if this will do it. Hey, Robert. Um, let's see. Uh... I'm trying to think of what I can do to kill time while I'm waiting for this. Um, still waiting for my Kindle to open too. It's being a little fickle. Let me see. Let me try to. Maybe if I kill my internet connection for a second. No, don't kill. My first book was actually called Andrew and the Pirate Cove. Actually, I wrote a bunch of um, illustrated books. The first one was called Andrew's Great Train Adventure. Yeah, um, like they were smaller books, like. There were the books. Uh, yeah. Like, it was like a long time ago, so yeah. yeah. It was when Andy was like five years, three or four years old. But my first uh, paperback was um, actually called Andrew and the Red Dragon, which is still available on KDP. Um, but it's not one that I published because it's, it was, it was just a little bit of a novella. It was like a hundred pages long, and it just, it was a fun story, but I didn't really flesh it out that well. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's try again. So, Marie, Andreas. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if I can get this to pop up. Oh, real quick. The Mayhem of Mermaids. Here's that other book. And that one's, um, and it's available for pre-order. Inspiration, the first one was probably because my uh, Andrew's first grade teacher told me that if I'm going to write books for him to read, that I should go ahead and um, go ahead and write, you know, books with actually wor a lot of words and no pictures. Um, and frankly, that seemed like a good idea. So um, I wrote um, Andrew and the Red Dragon because I liked, I liked uh, The Hobbit and all those stories. So I thought I might my own. So I couldn't get the Kindle to open, uh, the, 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 the look inside to open. So since Marie is such a, since, I'm a, since Marie is one of my favorite authors, I said to the heck with it. I just bought it. So now it's on Kindle. So now, see? 
What can I say? I'm a good friend. And Marie is one of my favorite authors. So it's another Marie Andreas book that I have purchased. So if any, if uh, if Marie wants to be grateful for me buying her book, she can thank my computer or thank Amazon for not loading the look inside thing. So because now I own it. Okay. So let's go ahead and read it. Yeah, she has some... I don't know who her cover artist is. I know she's used different people, but she gets her money's worth because she gets some great covers. I wish I could do covers like that. My covers are okay, but hers are really amazing. Okay, so let's go. The Hidden War by Marie Andreas. No, and let's not go. <laughs> let's see. Oh, here we go. Real quick, going to show you this. So these are the other books by Marie Andreas. The Lost Ancient series. These are all great books. I have The Glass Gargoyle and I have The, Go the Diamond Sphinx. The Asali Wars. I have books one and two. Like I said, book three I will get. Adventure of Smith and Joe and A Curious Invasion. I showed you that one. That's this one. Steampunk. And uh, The Mayhem of Rage is going to be out for, is, it looks like it's out for pre-order. And let's go ahead and get started with reading this, and then it's time for Vampire Princess after this. Okay, chapter one. Again! Eladria had heard the cry so many times today that she knew she'd be hearing echoes of it long after sword practice was over. Keeping her side to herself, she resumed her stance against Marco. The baker's apprentice wasn't someone you'd think would be training to fight. Short, round, and had tasted a bit more of his baked goods than was probably healthy. No such thing, by the way, but, you know, actually there is. But he was determined, and far more agile than she predicted. His form with the sword wasn't great. That was one of the reasons Armsmaster Sadlin kept recalling the move. But he was quick and twisty enough to almost get a blow in more than once. <clears throat> Do you think that type of fighting is going to save you? You signed up for this, Marco. Act like you mean it, Sadlin yelled, and then turned toward... Another pair of fighters give them a round of the same. Sadlin was one of the few surviving old fighters. Therefore, he got the job of training the new ones. Eladria wasn't a new fighter, but she wasn't anywhere near Sadlin, so she got the dubious honor of being the sparring partner for those Sadlin felt showed the most promise. After a few more rounds, both she and Marco were sweaty, and her right arm felt like it was ready to fall off. It's ridiculous that we have to go through all that. Sorry. It's ridiculous that we... Wow, I don't know why I can't read today. It's ridiculous that we have to all go through fight training like this. We're doing it because of myths and rumors. Justin came up behind her as she wiped down her equipment. He'd been sparring with another newer fighter, but as usual managed to look unsweaty. Eladria wasn't sure how to react to the tall archer. There was always a look of calculation going on in those blue eyes, constantly weighing the odds on what would be the best path for him. She did know, unfortunately, what he was talking about. He wasn't happy about the training, but it had become so ingrained in their village over the last two years that everyone of, a, of an age did it. Eladria was the only one who had lived through why they did it. She hadn't been born in this village. Her home village, Leven Levenal, was nothing more than a patch of dead ground and empty buildings and had been so for the last 15 years. Although she told little, even now, to the village elders of her adopted home, village of Bedlia, she still had nightmares of that night so long ago. Hey, Amanda. I read from your book a few minutes ago, uh, so uh, hopefully get, I'll send you the link for it afterwards, and I am going to put this on YouTube. Um, it had been a night of celebration, of joy, and remembrance. A light had shone down from above in the village center. She was frightened at first, but her parents had held, had held her hands and a wave of happiness flowed over her. The few people who hadn't already been in the clearing came in, pulled forward by the light. Everyone moved closer, and she first lost hold of one parent's hands, then the second, but it felt okay. Even at five years old, she felt comfort and safety. Oh, cool. Thanks, Amanda. Then a tall, dark shadow, moving almost too fast for her to see, grabbed her and threw her out of the, out of the light. She remembered pain and loss as she rolled in the dirt, scrambling to her feet to get back into the light. A massive wind rushed at her, pushing her away. Then the light and everyone in it vanished. Eladria was left alone. Her people were hardy. The villages of the, of the mountains and the plains of the country of Kader were spread out and self-sustaining. A proud people, they were united in their fierce independence. She had no memory of the time that passed before a fishing party from Bedlia came through Levenal. Eladria remembered that first night when the people vanished, 
but she didn't recall the time afterwards being found or the journey to the village of Bedlia. Her first memory was waking up in a small cottage with Gwenin, or as she called her mu now, mother. When she was older, she was told they believed she'd been alone in the empty village of her birth for a week or more. She took their word for it. Academics from all over Kader came to speculate on what happened to the people of Levenal. Many tried to interview El Eladria. However, Gwenin protected her and didn't let them. Eladria had told her story, what she recalled of it to the village elders. They were the ones who talked to the academics. After a few years, the Fuhrer died down. There were too many real dangers to deal with. The mystery of Levenal went unsolved. Eladria grew up as any other child in the village. She apprenticed to Sadlin in the blacksmithy. While not huge and bulky like her mentor, she was tall, far stronger than she looked, and always found a way to get her tasks done. Two years ago, another village vanished. This was a small village to the far north and high in the Snowland Mountains. Less than 40 people had lived there, and they were so isolated it was unclear when exactly they vanished. But the same black dead ground in the center of the village was there. That time, no one had remained. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put a bookmark in this. I'm going to read this whole thing eventually. It's, you know, it's not a very... It's a nice short story. Um, again, let me show you the cover. Um, let's see, cover. What a great one. This, why she is not a best-selling author on like USA Today and New York Times, I have no idea. She is one of the finest writers I've ever known. Hey, Liz. Speaking of great writers. Oh, Liz, since you're here. This is uh, by L. Stengworth, Liz Holmes, who just came in. Her book, Asunder, which is another, another great book. Uh, I'm just showing you that. I would show you the cover, but uh, yeah, do toss that book over there. See the one that says uh, not the, that one, since it's right here. And that's by Liz L. Steinworth. Just happen to have it here. Or let me just show it to you that way. Since Liz is here, I I don't have time to read from it now, right right now, Liz. But I at least wanted to give you guys, give you a shout out. This is a great book, and she's an artist. Uh, go to the art, the art of Liz com to see all the drawings, the paintings you did. She painted this painting and then wrote the book to explain the painting. And it's just, I don't know which is more amazing, her writing or her art. They're both incredible. Um, anyways, uh, that was Liz, uh, Liz Holmes. I will read from her book maybe tomorrow or very soon. I read from it pretty frequently because she is again, a great writer. And now it's on to Mama Fang and, um, Mama Fang, P. Mattern, um, or Patricia Nett, as you see her in here, is one of my favorite authors. Um, and I love reading her stuff. I've read, I've got a lot of her books um, on Kindle. And I'm going to read from Vampire Princess this time around. And I haven't read from this in a while. So real quick. Okay, guys, remember location. See, I don't know why this does this. I know I got farther than page nine in this book. But it pretty much just started me over at the beginning. Um, let me show you the cover. And it looks like there's a lot of new viewers in this page. So I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning. I don't think Mama Fang's going to mind because it's a great book. And there's no such thing as a, as a bad part of a P. Madden book. Thanks, Mama Fang. I gotta, I gotta go kind of quick here because um, I gotta leave to pick up my son pretty soon. Um, so I'm gonna start with the prologue. And one second here, let me just make sure I'm not parched. <laughs> Iced coffee is the most, and we all know uh, peppermint mocha for me. Okay, and I don't need these right now. Whoa. Whew. Anyways, I probably shouldn't have taken them off that quick. Okay, I guess I do need them, because now I'm getting blurry. Oh, well. Prologue. The hands that travel across my neck, the body are rough. Rough as a northern wind. Because my hands and ankles are chained together, I'm helpless to stop them. My teeth want to chatter, but I exert all the control at my disposal to prevent them from doing so. It is cold in this interior room, where I am surrounded by granite walls with veins of mica glinting through them. The solitary casement window is set up high upon the wall, affords only one winter pale shaft of light, and he has me stand in it so that he can get his fill of looking at me. My eyes are downcast, focused on the uneven flooring of slab stone as his hands travel over my shoulders. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. 
Sorry, I'm still not getting my voice all the way back. I got a cold like just after Thanksgiving and I'm still getting over it. It sucks. My eyes are downcast, focused on the uneven flooring of slab stone as his hands travel over my shoulder, my breast, and downward over my belly. He was doing a meticulously slow circle around me as I stand, trailing fingers over my shoulder blades, hips, and buttocks. There is no part of me that he omits in his tactile exploration of my body. He stops momentarily and... Oh, my pleasure. And leaning closely towards my ear, he says in an excited half-whisper, So beautiful. I should take you right now. Right here, Tristina. I can smell the dark licorice scent of absinthe on his breath. Oh, wait, that should be a feminine voice. He'd kill you. I'm mean, sorry, he'd kill you. I reply immediately, my voice demo devoid of emotion. I do not even bother to look up as I speak. My body is numb for both the circumstances and the cold, and I'm just stating a fact. He knows I'm right. I'm still focused on the floor, but I can hear the anger in his footfalls as he walks away to the heavy studded iron door, wraps on it once with authority, and exits. The closing door makes a final sound that reverberates throughout the cell, but to me, it is a welcome sound. He is gone. Still, the finality of it causes my heart to clench in despair, and I wonder for the thousandth time how I came to be here. Vampire Princess, Chapter 1, Five Months Earlier I could feel my mouth hanging open, but for some reason I couldn't move. It was like I had been stunned, frozen. I was facing my mother over the kitchen island where we had been yelling, trying to outshot each other in an effort to get the last word in the argument that we were having. She insisted I go back to my room and change because my strategically ripped jeans were offensive. I had refused. It wasn't our first argument over my taste in apparel and probably wouldn't be our last. Don't get me wrong, I love my mom, but she was not a role model for fashion forwardness. Her da typical daily uniform consisted of a shirt or long sleeve Henley shirt and a pair of cringeworthy granny waist jeans. I was determined not to follow in her lame footsteps, but now I was just staring at her because after my latest veiled insult, she had shouted the one thing that could produce a state of suspended animation in me. I had remarked in a snarky tone that I didn't see how we could be related, given her clueless sense of fashion. Tristina, I am not your mother, she had shouted back at me. She had immediately clamped her free hand, the one that she wasn't holding, that wasn't holding a dish rag over her mouth, but it was too late. Every word she shouted was burned into my consciousness. What? I finally got out, still staring at her. What are you talking about? Her eyes immediately filled with tears. Oh, Tris, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to tell you this way. Your dad and I were going to talk to you soon since you were going to be 17 next month. I didn't mean to hurt you. It just came out. Please don't. But I never heard what she was going to say next because I grabbed my backpack and bolted for the door. I took off at a run, springing down the sidewalk and counting my breaths as I tried to run down, as I ran to try to calm myself down. I thought about blowing off school entirely. I felt confused and disoriented. I had another mother? Where had she been all these years? And why hadn't my father even hinted that I wasn't a child of Desiree? Desi, as he called her. You will find out who her mother is in book two, by the way. I remember the two of them as the only parents I'd ever known. They've been through all my milestones, learning to walk, read, ride a bike, all my birthdays and Christmases, but only one of them was my real parent? I had slowed down to a brisk trot, gasping for air. It was starting to rain in a mist, the way it does in the late spring around here and I swore under my breath as I'd realized I'd forgotten my jacket, and my nearly waist-length hair was going to look flattened instead of ebullient and fluffy the way it usually does. I was so preoccupied with my old thoughts, my own thoughts, that I barely noticed a car slowly following me on my left side. It was only when I pulled alongside the sidewalk, still running, with the passenger side window scrolled down that I noticed a dark-haired guy leaning across the seat and trying to get my attention. And this is one of the worst villains in book coming up. By worse, I mean most despicable, hateful, but well-written. But yeah, I hate this character, but you're supposed to hate him. It was Seth Mullane, a boy in my class at school. He was usually pretty quiet, dark-haired, and devastatingly good-looking. He never lacked for female company at school. As he leaned over the passenger seat, his sexy anime cut hair fell over one eye. Hey, little girl, he said, smiling slightly. You want a ride from a dangerous stranger? You're not really a stranger. I said boldly. I've seen you at school, and yes, I don't care to get soaked before class. I added, grabbing the passenger door, door handle and sliding in. Big mistake, by the way. The car he was driving was some kind of classic. I could tell that even though I know nothing about cars in general, and even less about classic cars in particular. What kind of car is this? I asked, surveying the 
intricately detailed tortoiseshell inlaid dashboard in front of me. A 1959 Cadillac Coup de Ville, he said, deftly turning the wheel to navigate back out into the street. It was my, I mean my grandmother's. She left it to me. It was my all time, it's my all time favorite ride. Pristine condition, I remarked, looking around me, thinking that obsessive care must have taken care of it over the years. Um, you know, thinking that obsessive care must have been taking of it over the years, sorry. Hey, I needed to mail a letter on the way to school, Seth exclaimed, fumbling around in the bell compartment and emerging with some stamps. Do you mind putting the stamp on, on it for me? Don't do it. Don't do it. She's going to do it, by the way. I was so distracted by Desi's revelation, a throbbing head and a heart that was beginning to unthaw and ache like it always does whenever, when I've been emotionally wounded. Sure, I said, peeling one of the stamps off the plastic, licking it, and pushing it into the corner of the letter with my thumb. For some reason, it didn't stick well. I tried again, but the back of it refused to stick to the envelope. I made a frustrated sound to get Seth's attention and held the envelope out back to him. Okay, um, I do, I'm sorry, I would love to keep reading because it just gets... This book starts off good and like a like a Def Leppard song, it starts here and just gets really good. Uh, this is one of my favorite books. Uh, but I do gotta run, pick up my kid. Um, and I gotta take a shower before I do. It's been a hot, sweaty day, long sweaty day. Anyways, um, yes, and I'm working on Victor. I'm looking forward to that too. Um, anyways, I'm gonna do another live read tomorrow. I'm gonna upload this one to YouTube as soon as I can, probably later tonight. Thank you guys for all tuning in. Again, if you are an author and want me to read from your book, just send me a private message on Facebook and I'll be glad to do it, okay? Thank you guys for all tuning in and hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Ooh, got it again.